Good afternoon. <clears throat> Fidelma and I have been battling these issues on opposite sides for some 10 years in trial courts and appellate courts around the country. In fact, we are both coming from a five-week jury trial in Milwaukee uh, that occurred last week, which was a related issue, but not a public nuisance issue, so I'm not going to uh, dwell on that case. As Fidelma said, public nuisance is an old concept. The, the restatement, the second restatement, defines public nuisance as an unreasonable interference with a right common to the general public. And everyone here is familiar with public nuisance in uh, a blocked roadway, a noxious manufacturing operation, or a farm. And historically, that's where public nuisance has been limited to. But what happened beginning in the filing of the Rhode Island case, it was an effort to take a classic product liability case and smash it into the public nuisance concept. Now, I was interested to hear Fidelma say that this isn't some wacky theory that was dreamed up by plaintiff's attorneys, because that's not what Fidelma's partners said after the Rhode Island verdict came down. In fact, there was an article published in the Phoenix, which I think is one of the free newspapers that are in a number of cities, that was titled, Fidelma's Wacky Idea. <laughs> the title of the article was, Blame Fidelma's Wacky Idea for Rhode Island's Victory in Its Landmark Lead Paint Case. It went on to uh, quote uh, one of Fidelma's partners. That's what Fidelma Fitzpatrick's fellow lawyers initially nicknamed her legal theory, which argued that declaring lead paint a public nuisance might win a lawsuit against lead paint companies, reversing a string of losses in other states. It went on to quote Jack McConnell, who tried the case with Fidelma, we didn't call it a public nuisance at first, says Jack McConnell. We referred to it as Fidelma's wacky idea because it was initially hard to get your arms around. McConnell says previous cases against lead paint failed when plaintiffs used a traditional product liability approach. While paint is indeed a product, Made by companies, the lead pigment in paint can scientifically be tied to a particular manufacturer, thus checkmating the case, McConnell says. So Fitzpatrick and others at Motley Weiss theorized that rather than linking a company's batch of paint to a specific house, the state could argue that the widespread presence of paint throughout Rhode Island poses a health threat. And to the extent there was a genius in this theory, that was the genius. It was delinking public nuisance from any particular location, in fact, delinking it from any conduct. The case we tried for four and a half months in Rhode Island ultimately went to the jury without the jury having to find a public nuisance in any specific location, or having to find that there was any wrongful conduct whatsoever on the part of the defendants. This article concludes, I think rightly so, Fidelma's wacky idea isn't out of the woods yet. The companies Sherwin-Williams, NL Industries, and Millennium Holdings say they plan to appeal Silverstein's ruling to the state Supreme Court, and of course we are appealing that ruling. You know, there was something that um, came up in the punitive damage panel that uh, Professor Allen said that uh, I, I thought is actually applicable to this public nuisance issue. He was talking about the importance of tying rights and obligations to facts. And unless you tie rights and obligations to specific facts, you get arbitrary results. 
And that, we contend, is exactly what happened in the theory that was promulgated in Rhode Island. There were no specific facts that we could point to. We wanted to talk about specific locations to show that there was not a public nuisance. To the extent that there was a problem, it was caused by landlords, and there was conduct involved. But all of that was gone. And the theory was, it's the collective presence of lead paint in Rhode Island. What you essentially had was a public policy question. There was no fact-based case that the jury had. Now, what I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about, you've heard um, from Joe Spielman the outrage of it all. But let me talk a little bit more about the legal basis for all of this and why the underpinnings, we believe, are simply wrong in the way the Rhode Island trial court formulated the issue. And I think the best way to talk about this is in the context of the New Jersey case. Now, the New Jersey case is the only case, the only public nuisance case regarding lead pigment that has reached a state Supreme Court. The New Jersey Supreme Court came down with their decision earlier this year. And it was in regard to 26 different suits that were filed in New Jersey by different municipalities and governmental entities alleging public nuisance, fraud, civil conspiracy, unjust enrichment, and indemnification. The trial court consolidated the suits and then dismissed the complaints, finding that those suits were seeking an unwarranted and impermissible expansion of plaintiff's role as local government entities to act on behalf of the public. The case then went to the appellate, the intermediate appellate court in New Jersey. The intermediate court reversed, but only on the issue of public nuisance. And they reversed finding that the defendant did not need to control the property where the nuisance was found. One of the underpinnings, we argued, of public nuisance, that the defendant has to control the public nuisance and be able to do something about it. The intermediate court also found that public nuisance could extend to the sale of a product. So our argument that this is a product's liability case, it is not a public nuisance case, the court did not accept. And then the court found that the claims were not precluded by the New Jersey Product Liability Act, nor were they barred by the remoteness doctrine. Now, the New Jersey Supreme Court reversed that decision in what is the most thoroughly researched, comprehensive decision in the country on the issue. And I say that not just because we won, but it is a very carefully crafted opinion. The New Jersey Supreme Court ultimately concluded, after going back to four or five hundred years tracing public nuisance, concluded by carefully examining public nuisance and by tracing its developments through the centuries, we can only conclude that the plaintiffs' loosely articulated assertions here cannot find their basis in this tort. The court, in going through the history of public nuisance, said the essential elements of public nuisance as a theory of tort recovery find their genesis in the historical basis in crime and criminal prosecution. The importance of that was that conduct and location are essential elements of public nuisance, and that was what was dismissed with in the Rhode Island case. Now, the plaintiffs drew support in the New Jersey case and in other cases around the country from the state's Lead Poisoning Prevention Act. And almost all states now have some form of a Lead Poisoning Prevention Act that specifically says that if, as it did in New Jersey, 
that if there is a child with an elevated blood lead in a home that contains lead paint, that constitutes a public nuisance. And so the plaintiff said, so there, the state legislature itself has said that you can have a public nuisance. But what the court said is that unlike plaintiff's complaints, our legislature's use of the term public nuisance in the Lead Paint Act is in keeping with the term's historical meaning and intent. And what they meant by that was that, as the court went on to say, we must conclude that the legislature, consistent with traditional public nuisance concept, recognized that the appropriate target of the abatement and enforcement scheme must be the premises owner whose conduct has effectively caused the nuisance. The court then went on to say, plaintiffs ignore the fact that the conduct that created the health crisis is the conduct of the premises owner. Plaintiffs would therefore separate conduct and location and thus eliminate entirely the concept of control of the nuisance. Essentially, the New Jersey Supreme Court went back to the origins of public nuisance and said you cannot shove this essentially a product liability act or action into the concept of public nuisance. The court further went on to say in public nuisance terms then, were we to conclude that the plaintiffs has stated a claim, we would necessarily be concluding that the conduct of merely offering an everyday household product for sale can suffice for the purpose of interfering with a common right as we understand it. And then finally, the court said the inescapable fact is that carefully read, the claims asserted would instead be cognizable only as a product's liability claim. And that's what we repeatedly argued in Rhode Island, that this is a product's liability claim and should be brought under product's liability theories that have been developed for 50 years and ultimately the New Jersey Supreme Court, as we would contend correctly, agreed with us. And finally, there's the famous quote that uh, you've heard a couple of times now. The court concluded, we cannot help but agree with the observation, which was, by the way, our observation, that were we to find a cause of action here, nuisance law would become a monster that would devour in one gulp the entire law of tort. And that, ladies and gentlemen, we believe is the correct and what we hope ultimately the final word on public nuisance, although there are still many battlefronts going on. Fidelma also referred to the Wisconsin Supreme Court accepting public nuisance in uh, a lead pigment context. I believe it was actually the intermediate court. It has not reached the Wisconsin uh, court. And there was a trial tried where the city of Milwaukee sued one of these companies. And it went to trial uh, earlier this year for three or four weeks. And the defense won. The huge difference between the city of Milwaukee case and the Rhode Island case is that in Milwaukee, the court required that in order to find a public nuisance, the jury had to find some wrongful conduct on the part of the defendant. And in fact, the jury there did not find wrongful conduct in a unanimous decision and held that there was no liability for um, National Lead, now known as NL, one of the defendants. There is only one other case that I want to talk a little bit about, the Joe ways because it is also an important case bearing on many of these issues, which is the case out of the Supreme Court in California, the Clancy decision, 
that was decided in 1985 that has now had some significant bearing on the public nuisance cases, especially in California. The Clancy decision dealt with a public nuisance action that was brought by the, I think it was the city of Corona, who retained contingent fee counsel to bring the action. Ultimately, the case worked its way to the California Supreme Court, and the California Supreme Court threw it out and held that in instances where a governmental entity is giving its police power, and I emphasize it's the police power, it's not the contractual kind of run-of-the-mill case, but when a governmental entity is enforcing its police power, it cannot do it on a contingent fee basis. The court said, we evaluate the propriety of a contingent fee agreement between a city government and a private attorney whom it hired to bring abatement actions under the city's nuisance ordinance. The court then said, when a government attorney has a personal interest in the litigation, the neutrality that is so essential to the system is violated. The court said there is a class of civil actions that demands the representative of the government to be absolutely neutral. This requirement precludes the use in such cases of contingent fee agreements. Now, ultimately, a number of governmental entities in California brought one of these lead pigment actions, including the cities of Oakland, Los Angeles, uh, San Diego, uh, San Francisco. It went through some three or four motions for demur with repletings allowed. Ultimately, the trial court threw the case out. It went up to the 6th District. The 6th District reinstated the nuisance and fraud allegations, it went back, at which point we then moved that the contingent fee arrangement with the plaintiff's counsel had to be set aside under Clancy. The court, the Superior Court agreed and held given the inherent difficulties of determining whether and to what extent the prosecutor of this nuisance action might or will be influenced by the presence of outside counsel, outside counsel must be precluded from operating under a contingent fee agreement. That case then was appealed to the 6th District again, which is where it's at. So I think those are two of the really important decisions that put all of this into perspective. That one, public nuisance is not appropriate for what is in every other court and probably every other day a relatively routine product liability action. But number two, when it is a governmental entity that is seeking to enforce a public nuisance theory, whether against us or anyone else, the neutrality of the governmental entity is absolutely essential, and the contingent fee arrangement in that context is against public policy and should not be allowed. And my time is up, and I'll end it with that. Thank you very much, Mike.